Okay, we're going to get started. I know a few people are probably still joining, so I'm going to start with just a real quick announcement. I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today um, uh, for this, this very special uh, lecture we're doing on help with HIPAA. Uh, my name is Eric Peterson. I'm the board president of the Utah Headliners chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Um, very excited about this, this event. I just wanted to give a Quick note uh, to our, our uh, Utah journalists. Um, you'll probably recall that usually around this time is when we are having our awards banquet. Uh, it's usually this week every year. Of course, uh, nothing has been normal about the last year or so. And we really wanted to have our awards banquet be once again in person. Um, so we were pushing it back to August just, just to be safe. Um, and uh, we're very excited about that. It's gonna be August 5th. It's gonna be at the Gallivan Center. Uh, you might recall that's where we had it a couple of years ago <clears throat> in the before time. Um, and so be on the lookout. We'll be sending some notices and emails out about that. Um, if you you know want to get on an email list or you're not a member, you're curious about that, you can always email us at utahspj at gmail.com and um, we can get you signed up. We can you know, put you on our mailing list, uh, let you know about all the great programming we do throughout the year. Um, with that, I'm going to get started, introduce our guest uh, today. Uh, if you might have heard just a little while ago, goes by Jeff, Jeff Jeffrey. A and Jeff is an attorney of over three decades who represents hospitals and hospital systems on everything from corporate corporate governance and contracts to advising clients on state and federal regulations regarding fraud, privacy, other key issues. Uh, not only does he often conduct compliance investigations related to HIPAA breaches for his clients, but as a former co-chair of the policy advisory group for the work group on electronic data interchange, WEDI, uh, Tom worked with a coalition of stakeholders to provide in input to the initial HIPAA privacy rule. Um, Tom is also an active member of the American Bar Association, the American Health Lawyers Association, and the Healthcare Compliance Association. Uh, he previously served as the vice chairman of the California Medical Association Foundation, and he's currently a partner with the firm Errant Fox, based in Los Angeles, California, where he's joining us from now. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jeff. Uh, help us understand and help us out with HIPAA. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, Eric. Um, uh, I, I do want to, there was one thing that you didn't mention, and that is uh, I actually uh, was a classmate of Gene Norman's, uh, went to Medill School of Journalism, um, did my internship uh, at the Miami Herald, and then um, worked for a couple of years uh, in, for a professional association of dermatologists. Uh, which was interesting as their director of communications and managing their press relations and stuff. So uh, it was that kind of hook into healthcare from working with that association that led me to go to law school and kind of do what I'm uh, doing now. But um, uh, I do have a, a little bit of that journalism um, background. Um, so I thought uh, we do some basics on HIPAA, talk a little bit about how the news media um, deals with HIPAA or, or sort of what, what the lay of the land is relative to that. Um, maybe discuss a little bit on um, uh, how to navigate that and um, then we'll um, open it up for uh, uh, questions in whatever format Eric is typical for, for your group. Um, so HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, I think it's of 1994, but sometimes I get those years messed up a little bit. And in the original intent of HIPAA was to do three things. The first one actually was the one that got all the headlines and that was portability in health insurance. Um, prior to HIPAA, if you changed employers, um, there would be a, a waiting period before the insurance under the new employer took effect. It might be 60 days or a couple of months or that. And the problem was if you had a condition, if you had a family member with a chronic condition, 
um, that gap in insurance, um, in essence, sort of tied you to your job and, and was problematic. Um, the healthcare provider community initially focused on another part of HIPAA, which was the accountability. And, and what that imposed uh, was, gave the government the ability to impose civil monetary penalties for violations of certain federal laws, you know, related to anti-kickback statute, Stark, that type of thing. The third part was sort of the sleeper. And the, sleep, the third part was, um, was known as administrative simplification. And if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. Um, uh, HIPAA, um, and, and this one, the, the purpose of this was to sort of help healthcare get out of the dark ages and provide for a common electronic language to communicate with. A lot of uh, hospitals and insurers had sort of their own legacy systems and, and nobody talked to one another and you had to have clearing houses to, to do a crosswalk of information. And the whole idea was to come up with sort of a common coding um, and system of, of handling electronic health records. Um, with that, and and there was a big push in Congress at the time was okay. Well, if you're gonna if you're gonna make everything integrated and make it easy to transfer information, which is good, uh, we have very specific concerns about protecting individuals' uh, privacy in in the healthcare information that's you know collected by insurance companies, by um, uh, providers, and and those that do business with them who have access to that information. So in there was requirements that the Secretary uh, of Health and Human Services come up with regulations to uh, protect individual rights, um, make sure that the information that was stored, whether it was electronically stored or in paper or otherwise, uh, was protected. So uh, who it applies to um, are the, the term of art in the regulation is covered entities. And uh, covered entities are uh, healthcare providers that um, do electronic transfer exchanges. And that's basically everyone because uh, uh, you're not gonna get paid as a provider unless you are submitting claims electronically. Um, insurance companies, insurers that include health plans, HMOs, um, are, are required. Um, and the another initial one was covered entities. And covered entities were, I'm sorry, not covered entities, were healthcare clearinghouses. And healthcare clearinghouses was sort of the uh, organizations that took information from providers and turned it into the language that um, uh, the health insurers could handle in, in, until, of course, the, the common coding was implemented. So uh, later, um, it was made to apply to what's called the business associates of these covered entities. And business associates are um, organizations who uh, either receive or collect the uh, health information, which we'll get to in a second, on behalf of a covered entity. Um, uh, there's always been a requirement from the early days that there be an agreement that the covered entities or that the uh, business associates protect that health information that they receive. But um, uh, with the uh, passage of high tech, they now are directly liable and responsible for maintaining that privacy, in addition to having this separate agreement with the covered entity for which they do work for. Um, so those are the main entities that um, are um, uh, to whom it ap applies to. And providers could include everything from clinics, hospitals, uh, surgery centers, um, uh, pharmacies. It would be a broad range of people who, who bill for healthcare services or goods. 
Um, what does it restrict? Well, um, it restricts um, the disclosure or use of protected health information um, uh, without the consent of the patient, except for treatment and payment purposes. So um, uh, doctors can um, talk about patients, uh, mutual patients together. Um, doctors can submit health information to file a claim. Um, that, that's not really what it's designed to restrict, but it does restrict pretty much every other type of use or disclosure of information. Um, uh, unless the patient or their representative um, authorizes it. Um, but what is uh, protected health information? Well, health information, pretty basic. Um, it's, it's information dealing with the uh, condition, uh, treatment, or prognosis uh, of an individual. Again, very broad. Um, it, it certainly includes everything in medical record, but um, includes a lot more. The other key to have protected health information is it has to be identifiable. And um, there are a number of, I think over 18 identifiers, uh, obviously name, it's common, but uh, it could be facial identifiers, medical record numbers are identifiers, license plates are identifiers, phone numbers are identifiers. It's, it's really a pretty extensive list. So when you have sort of linked together health information uh, with identifiers, uh, with, with, and it can just be just one identifier, that's protected health information, and that's what's restricted under HIPAA. Um, again, we talked a little bit of, of why it exists. It's, it's to protect uh, individuals because information is now going to be more readily accessible and transferable with the advent of electronic medical records um, to, to keep it um, private and secure. Um, I'm going to talk about primarily the privacy rule, but there's also a security rule that um, uh, requires covered entities and, and business associates to have administrative safeguards to, um, you know, protect uh, that health information from hackers and, and others from coming in. Um, but again, um, I'm going to make the assumption uh, journalists te don't usually hack in to get the information. And so I'm going to focus uh, uh, pretty much on the privacy uh, provisions of HIPAA. Number of exceptions to HIPAA. Um, I, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, uh, obviously, um, uh, agencies that are um, uh, intended to uh, oversee, have health oversight of uh, covered entities, licensing, uh, Medicare, um, uh, HIPAA, you, there's an exception for uh, them. They're having the ability to access uh, information without the authorization of the patient. Um, there are ones that have certain limitations. Uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, police can't just come in and ask for medical records, although they think they can a lot of times, but there has to be a certain set of conditions um, making it an urgent need for such information. Um, and, and not just under all circumstances. Um, I can tell you there is no journalism or public right to know exception in HIPAA. So um, uh, um, I, but, but you should know that they are out there. So um, when, when dealing with um, sort of HIPAA uh, and I, I've, represented on HIPAA matters, hospitals, um, large multi-specialty clinics. Again, it, it applies to even individual physician offices or uh, a variety of, um, uh, of entities. Um, but from the hospital's perspective, they need to um, 
take appropriate steps to safeguard the information. And, and one of them, which I think has a, a, a big impact on, on journalists and on the public in general, is sort of access to their facility. Um, uh, and uh, to some extent, the way they um, uh, operate. So for instance, um, a lot of times in emergency rooms, you'll see a, a big whiteboard and it will have the patient's last name. It may have what the triage um, diagnosis or, or assessment was, you know, what room they're in. So it's health information and identifiers. And, um, you know, uh, if someone's just roaming around, um, they can uh, clearly and um, uh, that's would be an unauthorized um, disclosure. That's not to say that those whiteboards have um, gone away, but again, um, there's a sensitivity to, um, you know, who has access and ability to, to see those. Um, hospitals also um, uh, are required to, as part of their obligations as a covered entity, that if there are any unauthorized disclosures, they have to inform the patient or the, the person whose record was compromised. Um, they may have to report to, well, they will have to report to federal authorities, depending on how many records were compromised, um, uh, will result in how that's reported. And um, um, uh, under certain state laws, there may be liabilities. Um, the hospitals and other covered entities face um, fines on a on a a graduating tier schedule that can go up to $200,000 per incident. Um, I'm not aware, uh, there have been multi-million dollar fines imposed for HIPAA violations. Um, 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 but, and, and so hospitals take this seriously because that's a, a big financial um, hit to, to them. So, uh, they need to sort of control their environment um, and um, they will uh, go to great lengths to, to do that. So, you know, what about reality TV or, or you will see news crews, um, uh, uh, particularly I think during COVID who went into emergency rooms or, or, or units and, and did that. Um, th those are are typically well orchestrated by the hospitals um, so that um, um, unless a, a particular patient gave consent to have their um, face seen, um, they're, they're blurred out. Um, there won't be any shots of the, the whiteboards that I was talking about um, to, to provide that information. and. And if they've talked to a patient or they've talked to a nurse or doctor who's treating a patient who's, who's identified in the story, um, that was all pursuant to um, an authorization and consent. So I think there's room to sort of negotiate access, um, but um, the hospital will kind of impose um, its rules and, and restrictions on that and, and will not uh, allow and really can't allow sort of the free access um, uh, to people just coming in. Um, it's been interesting on, on reality TV shows that deal with um, uh, sort of healthcare matters and, and um, uh, reality shows have their own consent and release forms, um, even if it's not related to someone's health care, um, 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 that they, participants have to sign. And it's interesting, I've looked at these and they're like multiple pages and you give up any, you know, rights to, um, you know, to object to it, to your identity, to, you know, any, 
profits that may be obtained through that. Um, but what was interesting is reality TV shows, um, you know, if it deals with healthcare, they need to have a HIPAA um, authorization as well from that participant. And um, the, that participant um, does have the right to, independent of the other contract, to withhold its consent to the release of um, medical information. Um, and those authorizations also can be limited. So, you know, for instance, um, the hospital uh, or the physician treating a patient, a celebrity or, or someone famous um, uh, may have a press conference. And, um, uh, you know, presumably that was, um, if, if, you know, particularly if it goes beyond kind of general condition, um, uh, the, that will have been because the patient authorized that. And the patient, it's not an all or nothing thing. The patient can say, uh, I authorize you to disclose X, Y, and Z, but not um, A, B, and C. So uh, um, you, you may not get the whole picture potentially um, because the physicians who are conducting that press conference may be restricted based on the authorization um, that they were given. And, and um, uh, if the question or the information requested goes beyond what their authorization is, um, they should and probably will um, you know, not, not comment on that. Um, and the authorization, just so you know, has to provide for a particular, it must be in a particular format. Um, it, it has to be revocable. It, 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 there's a series of requirements um, for that. Um, uh, and you, they can't condition care um, on a patient's um, agreement to, to sign a particular authorization. Um, uh, or consent on that. Um, there have been a lot of celebrity cases where um, hospitals um, have had to um, uh, take special measures uh, to protect privacy. Um, uh, in, and you should, uh, I think, be aware of those. Um, one, and of course you can imagine in Los Angeles, hospitals are pretty sophisticated um, about that, um, when a when a person comes into a hospital, um, their name is registered, and they can, if if you call the hospital and say, "I'd like to talk to such and such," or "I'd like to find out how such and such is doing," um, the the hospitals are permitted to have a directory. And when they're asked that question, um, they can indicate, you know, the, the, yes, the patient is here and they're in stable condition, good condition, you know, under observation, whatever it is, but, but they really can't provide any information beyond that. And um, the patient or their representative um, is the one who controls whether they can have their name in the directory. So a lot of hospitals will not put people in the directory unless they affirmatively say it's okay, or they will inform patients that if they don't want their name in the directory, um, they, they will, they have the right to insist that it's withdrawn. Celebrities um, typically are admitted into the hospital under, the, under an alias and only the specific providers treating doctors and nurses and techs treating that particular patient will know what, what the alias is. Um, so even if somebody else kind of came in or tried to sniff through to find out, well, I wanna you know, um, see what the condition of Michael Jackson is, um, it's, it is, usual protocol for them to to not have that record um, under his particular name or 
uh, any other type of identifier. Um, that, um, that being said, uh, there are still cases where information gets out. Um, one, one of the cases that uh, you may recall was the Octomom case. This is where I think it was the first uh, woman to give birth to eight babies at the same time. And um, there was a lot of ethical issues and questions about that. And, um, uh, and obviously the news media was hungry to get whatever information they could um, while the mother and the babies were still in the hospital. Um, uh, the, there were a number of um, whether they were trying to um, do it to help their um, journalist buddy out or um, were just curious who actually, um, you know, went into the records. This was not, I think her name was Suleiman or something and, it's, uh, and that was known. Um, and so there were a number of people who inappropriately had no reason to access the medical records other than they were curious. Um, those were violations of HIPAA. They were not part of her treatment team um, and they weren't authorized to use or, or to see that information. And so um, uh, those individuals were, um, because the hospital tracks when somebody goes into their electronic health records, tracks who accesses it, how long it is, um, what hospitals will do, um, again, to um, uh, avoid the, well, I didn't, I didn't know, or it was a mistake, is they have what they call the, the break the glass protocol. And what that means is for certain records of, of sensitive individuals, it will pop up, screen will pop up if you're not part of their regular treatment team. And it says, you know, this is a, a restricted um, uh, file, restricted record um, by, uh, if, you, if you decide to continue, you're acknowledging that you're, you know, been authorized to do so, or you're providing, um, you know, necessary care and treatment for the patient. And so they can't, they can't sort of claim of, you know, ignorance or uh, that it was some sort of a mistake. There's that pop-up that makes sure that they know, you know, what they're doing. And, and the reason for that is um, you don't want to just restrict information to the team. Maybe somebody has to come in with a crash cart or um, somebody's covering for uh, another nurse who had another crisis from another floor. Uh, they may need to to access it, and there would be legitimate reasons. But again, the, those are always being monitored um, by the hospital IT and 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 tech people. Um, the um, uh, I, I think I mentioned Michael Jackson. There have been a number of cases against hospitals, um, and I would point out that. Um, uh, HIPAA has penalties that the government can impose for violations. There are also state laws that I have to confess I'm not familiar with Utah uh, uh, health information privacy laws. California has a rather extensive statute um, called SAMEA, the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, um, and it does impose penalties on, um, you know, individuals beyond just covered entities who inappropriately disclose um, healthcare information. Um, uh, so a number of hospitals, including UCLA and Cedars, have been subject to some of these lawsuits. Um, uh, and there are a variety of reasons or ways that that information inappropriately got out, but it was, it was clear that the hosp that the information animated or, or or came out of the hospital or one of its, um, one of its agents. So, sort of to to finish up, 
Um, uh, um, and then I'll look at the chat and we can do um, questions. You know, how should journalists navigate HIPAA? Well, one thing, kind of going back to uh, to whom does it apply, um, is consider the source. If a family member comes out um, yeah, of the, you know, of the hospital and um, they were just with the patient and the doctor and the doctor talked to the patient about what was going on and, and the family member, the patient always has the right to ask the family member to, to leave, but if, if the patient doesn't object, the assumption is the family member, it's okay to disclose information in front of the family member. Um, again, only in the patient presence of a conscious patient. Um, that's fine. I mean, uh, that's not a violation of HIPAA. Yes, it's healthcare information. Yes, it's identifiable, but the source was a family member not a doctor, not a hospital employee, not a, a, a contractor for the hospital. Um, and so that information is is not restricted and, and you know, would be fair game. Um, uh, obviously, um, information that uh, is authorized or, or disclosed by the patient themselves. So in other words, the patient you know, um, issues their own release or gets wheeled out and answers their own questions, that's not protected um, either. Um, and again, to the extent that there's an authorization or consent in place, um, uh, the individuals who have in the hospital uh, who have that um, consent or authorization um, can disclose information within the parameters of that authorization. Um, but you should know that um, if you have sources, quote unquote, within uh, you know the healthcare organization um, who you know has access to the information, whether they're you know employees or uh, other physicians or, or um, you know, vendors, you know, somebody that, you know, handles um, drug inventory deliveries or, or food vendors or whatever else, because um, they have, you know, they have access to records for dietary purposes. Um, you cannot, if, if those persons disclose information to you, those persons um, uh, will in every situation that I've been aware of be held accountable. And that usually means their employment will be terminated, their contract will be terminated, um, and, and they will face some disciplinary measures in addition to which that will trigger the, the hospitals uh, or covered entities requirement to tell the patient about it and to um, you know disclose it uh, or, or to report it to um, government agencies. So um, I, I think there's a little bit of an ethical issue in terms of how hard, or, or you know, when you push sources that are uh, sources that are subject to the HIPAA, you know, again, um, being providers, their employees, their contractors, um, and, and others. So that was um, um, I, uh, one other sort of footnote on authorizations. Um, there are special requirements. Um, I, I think because these are deal uh, considered specifically um, um, private types of information. There are special requirements um, for. Uh, authorizations to release a patient's mental health information, um, or um, if they have um, tested positive for for AIDS, um, but um, and and in addition to which, there's other federal laws that really preclude 
certain mental health providers from even acknowledging or indicating if, if someone's in a facility for treatment. In other words, they don't have, um, they don't have the ability to have that sort of general um, uh, roster of, of patients. Um, so with that, I will go to questions. Um, uh, reality shows are an interesting case. Do, you, do the producers get the permission beforehand during the emergency or after the fact? Um, the, <laughs> uh, the producers, if it's not an emergency, I think the producers obviously want to get it beforehand. So kind of in a reality show and, and those shows are probably more scripted than most people, um, appreciate, um, well, they'll get the permissions, um, upfront, um, in certain emergency situations, again, um, uh, that would have to, um, uh, you would need that authorization to, um, uh, to, to broadcast it. I do know that some hospitals, and I don't know specifically on emergencies, but they will actually have their own crews take the footage and then if they get consent, they will release that to the producers. So in other words, the, the information never really leaves the control of the hospital and, and then they get the authorization um, after the fact. Um, okay, yeah, that the public health information officer, and this is where I think there's a lot of confusion said that they couldn't tell reporters the city it happened in or which the police department responded due to HIPAA. Um, and, and that's just not true. Why is that not, not true? Because um, even if we say, okay, you know, we, we know their condition is shotgun, whatever, you know, somebody came in because of that. Um, that if even if there's health information, where's the identifier? You know, the fact that, you know, police brought them in, or uh, I will say ambulances are subject to, to HIPAA, but, but the fact that um, there was a, a, you know, a report or what city it's in, um, that's, um, I don't think that should be a problem or issue. Um, the location identifiers, address can be an identifier, but um, usually that um, goes to um, uh, the first three digits of a zip code. So I guess if a city had just one zip code in theory, that could be a problem, but you know, in, in larger cities, um, uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, think that that would, um, uh, be an issue. Um, uh, and, and yes, there can be people who, uh, abuse HIPAA to deny that kind of information. It's, it's interesting. There were a lot of, um, at the beginning part of COVID, we heard reports of a lot of, um, gyms who were saying that they couldn't release um, the information of people who had maybe gone to the gym um, where there was a COVID, you know, it was contact tracing or COVID outlet because of HIPAA. Well, again, go back to what we started out with. They're not a covered entity and they're not a business associate of a covered entity. So, you know, they're not a provider of healthcare. Um, and so HIPAA, would not preclude them from giving that information to to the authorities or to anyone else. But it's it's interesting how people try to use or twist it. Um, uh, police agencies are not covered entities. Um, law enforcement disclosures for law enforcement purposes are subject to the exception and subject to the requirements under the exception. Um, I think the general, and I, I 
it's been a while since I've looked at it, but the general exception for law enforcement is um, there has to be some sort of imminent danger to um, the person um, either escaping or um, you know others being hurt and injured. Um, unless they can indicate that to the satisfaction of the physician treating that patient, um, they, they're not quote unquote entitled to get that information. There are oversight agencies like the DEA or um, uh, the medical board. And, and so they say, well, you know, yes, we're law enforcement, but we're also healthcare oversight. And so they, they fit under another exception. Um, I should say too, hospitals and larger um, uh, entities have, we talked about a public information officer, but they have a privacy officer. And the privacy officer is actually responsible for overseeing the rules and protocols and requirements um, under, under HIPAA. And so they would be ultimately the ones that um, would make the call on whether a particular exception um, applies. Um, how can journalists um, uh, how can journalists respond to a denial that clearly isn't a HIPAA issue? Well, um, you know, I, I, you can't force people to talk. Um, uh, but um, again, you know, um, they can do a lot of things in terms of delim limit your physical access to the hospital, which means limiting your physical access to the patient or maybe their families or that type of thing. Um, I, I think like anything, you never want to be in a position, I think as a journalist, to have to negotiate. Um, but to some extent, that may be um, kind of um, what what you need to do. And and I'll you know, kind of as a lawyer, I'll I'll one of my tricks is, all right, <clears throat> now um, this is I, 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 help me understand why this is subject to HIPAA, and then let them trip themselves up and say, okay. Um, yeah, but I'm not asking for identifiable information, or I'm not asking for uh, health information. I'm, I'm, you know, how many, how many? What's your census? How many patients are there today, or whatever? So um, let them indicate, see how well they know HIPAA, and then um, kind of be informed to push back and say, well, I, I don't understand this, this. This isn't protected health information because it doesn't meet the requirement of being health information and identifiable. Or you're not a covered entity. You're not you're not subject to that. Or a business associate, you know, working for a covered entity. So, um, you know, kind of like the the um, gym example I just gave. So um, hey hey Jeff, just just jumping in on on that. So. I think that's I think that's really where the rubber hits the road for a lot of people sometimes feeling like, you know, maybe it's a police agency or something. They're trying to play the HIPAA card when they're not able to. So, I mean, just kind of continuing that that idea you're just talking about. So, I mean, the kinds of follow-ups, I mean, you can imagine a reporter, you know, that doesn't want to get pushed around might be like what say like you know, so what is the identifier that's giving away the information? Or can you sh demonstrate that you're a covered entity? Are these the kinds of things you would probably ask if you felt like you're getting the it, runaround? It, exactly. So for instance, um, the police says, agency says, well, we can't release information. And well, sure, any information they have, let me put it this way, HIPAA doesn't preclude them from um, releasing any information because they're not a covered entity. Now, the the EMS unit of the fire department and maybe the fire department as an extension of that might not be able to release that information because they're providing healthcare services, 
you know, and to the extent it's it's identifiable to a, you know, particular accident or or some identifier, you know, is out there. It's it's clear whose information it is. Then they may be restricted. But again, that's you're exactly right. That's why I started out with, you know, kind of, um, are they subject to HIPAA? You know, are they a covered entity or a business associate? Um, is it protected health information? Is it identifiable? And and is it you know health information? And and I think armed with that, um, um, you know, you've got a good um, sort of a good pushback to to start with. And and. And and then again, maybe you negotiate what information you you can get. Say, well, look, if if uh, you know, if I just say that, you know, you admitted three hundred patients with COVID this morning or today, what's where's the harm in that? Because there's no, we don't know the names or identities of the three hundred people you admitted. You know, and and. And so hopefully, but I, 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 I know that this gets thrown around um, uh, a lot. The other thing I, I would say, if they are a covered entity, obviously the police department, they'll have a public information officer, but they won't have a, a privacy officer. But if you're, if you're talking to a covered entity, um, you know, uh, ask the public information officer uh, you know, let's get the privacy officer here and let's sort this out because I want to understand why. I, I don't think this is the case, but let's let's see what the privacy officer has to say. I, I'm sure the public information officer will probably keel over at that suggestion, but but again, that's um, um, you know another tactic you might want to use. Um, for instance, municipal fire department, when they send an ambulance, what can they disclose? Probably very little um, um, uh, because again, that's their, their, uh, their healthcare provider. They're providing a health service and they're gonna bill electronically for it. So. Um, Let's see. Any, any oh, other questions or let's see we got one in the q a uh oh maybe we already talked about this though uh can police agencies violate hipaa laws uh, are journalists subject to hipaa laws uh it's a tendy row here sometimes police officers court personnel or other government agencies claim they can't release certain information because of hipaa but are any of these groups considered business associates that are subject to hipaa so kind of talked a little bit about that but so um, let's talk a little bit about court records. Um, the, there is an exception for litigation. And um, the exception for litigation is generally that um, uh, if the other party whose information it is, let's say it's a plaintiff suing a hospital or patient suing a hospital, in the hospital um, um, uh, will not disclose even a request for documents or information, um, the patient's medical records, um, unless um, they get an authorization. Or let's say it's somebody else. That, that's actually the case where it comes up. The patient sues the hospital, but the records that are being subpoenaed or that of the um, uh, of the individual physician who's not a party to the lawsuit. So then the individual physician says, um, okay, I will do that, but I need an authorization. And the patient says, I won't give an authorization, even if it's the hospital who's requesting the record. So then they have to bring a motion to, um, you know, compel release of those records and information. And the covered entity, and there's different statutes in different states, but the covered entity, uh, in essence, has to give notice to the patient or their representative that 
the records are being requested. And then that person, that patient or representative is given an opportunity to object to um, the release of that information. And then the court um, makes an order um, you know, based on that. Typically part of the court order or, or the parties can agree that you know, protected health information will be exchanged in the court, but there's a, a kind of a confidentiality protective order that guards that information. I would, if to be very technical, I would say it's the court order or the court process that's protecting the information, but it, it emanates from HIPAA. So if a court clerk says, well, HIPAA prevents me from uh, disclosing it, um, no, it's probably the court order or the um, court mandated confidentiality agreement that's protecting that information and keeping it under seal. And, and remember, agencies ha have other laws that um, they, you know, that they have to comply with that deal with privacy of all sorts of information. And I, I think sometimes it's like, oh, I'll just throw out HIPAA because I, you know, that'll scare everybody and it's health information. So it's just easier to say HIPAA, but it may, you know, there may be other um, laws that uh, either don't require them to um, provide that information or, um, uh, you know, preclude them from sharing that information. They just don't know which one. Yeah, speaking of other laws, somebody also just asked, and I don't know if this is something you can address, but someone said, what about in the instance with a university or a university police department who claims FERPA along with any other XYZ law they can come up with? Any tips or tricks to negotiate getting even nuts and bolts info? Um, I'm just not familiar with FERPA. Um, uh, it is interesting I will kind of a little bit of an aside. Um, there was a, you, you get kind of uh, overlapping rules. So there was a, um, an entity that um, um, I, I represented that I did healthcare and counseling um, and education services. And so it was one organization, but um, uh, it was providing, you know, both healthcare uh, or both healthcare services <clears throat> and educational services. And um, the issue was, can you could could the the healthcare um, individuals share medical records with the educators and could the educators share, you know, some of their records with the healthcare individuals. <clears throat> and um, it, there, were, there was no exception for that. Uh, obviously we looked, and tried to fit it in that. Um, and, you know, what we concluded was when you intake um, persons, you had to get their authorization so that even those internal sharing of information, some subject to FERPA, some subject to HIPAA, um, were permitted to be disclosed. And, and I do say that, you know, authorizations and consents um, sort of trump everything. It, it, the, the easiest way to get information is to get a, a, a consent or authorization from the patient or their designated representative. But obviously, um, if you don't even know who the patient is, that's going to be difficult to do. I was, I was kind of curious too, just about on kind of the consent issue, if you know, like journalists need to worry if, for example, they get information from a source, they want to provide them information, maybe about their health or something. I know I've done a story before where, you know, a parent provided a lot of 
health information about a, a child who had some mental health issues. And it was a story where she felt like the school system was not, uh, you know, treating, treating her son well. And, you know, looking back, I kind of like wonder like, well, you know, she gave it to me. She said it was fine, but you know, you know, is it something journalists should worry about? Like maybe a source coming back later and going, you know, like we never signed anything, you know, we never. Well, no, she, you know, she, she's on the record, right? Yeah. You know, she's disclosing it. Now, let me tell you what you should be leery of. Uh, and I have had this situation come up. You have somebody who is gone to the press, has gone crazy about, you know, um, I was mistreated. I, you know, this happened and that happened and, you know, they're horrible and awful. And, and, um, this happened to have been a mental health facility and, um, and the reporters did what a good reporter say, let's get the other side of the story. Let's call the, the mental health facility and, and get their response to this. And the mental health facility said, okay, we, we have some very factual information and defenses to this, and we wanna tell our story, uh, can we do it? And I had to say, no, unless you get the patient's authorization to release that information. And of course, the patient who is mad and upset at the at the provider here uh, said, "Oh hell no, I won't do that." So um, that's a real dilemma that I think covered entities can get into: is the the patient's blab, but you, they now you can't confirm that story um, unless they give that authorization. So you know it, it would be a good thing to ask, like. You know, I'm I'm interested in your story, but I'm I'm committed to you know hearing all sides and angles. I said I I don't even want to talk to you unless I know you will give your authorization, uh, HIPAA authorization for for the hospital or whoever to talk to me. Because um, I think you know, in the interest of you doing your job, in in fundamental fairness, um, that's appropriate. Yeah, a good way to check to the source's kind of commitment to their story to say, like, you, will you let them show their cards as well? Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, I don't know if there's, I think that's all the questions we've got. Well, hopefully I've been of some help and insight. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I've actually enjoyed this. and. Yeah. Yeah, well, we really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, and uh, thank, thanks for everyone for attending. We are recording this and we'll, you know, we'll put this up on our YouTube as well for those of you who might have missed it. But uh, with that, I think we'll say thank, thanks a lot, uh, Jeff. It, it's really been enlightening. We really appreciate your time. Okay, great. And send me the YouTube link when you, uh, when you get it. I will. Appreciate okay. That. All right. Thanks, Eric. Alrighty. Thanks, Gene. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone.